Okay, so let's get started. Um, I am delighted to introduce our next speaker, uh, Maria Theologidou, uh, who is giving the fourth 30-minute talk today. Uh, Maria is an English teacher, trainer, oral examiner, and a blogger. She has contributed to publications and journals, presented workshops in local and international conferences, and is currently the vice chair and editor-in-chief of TESOL Macedonia III, Northern Greece. Uh, over to you, Maria. Thank you so much, Helen, and thank you everyone for being here with us today. Good evening from Thessaloniki, Greece, and as Helen said, I will be focusing today on an issue that I feel really passionately about, and that's uh, creativity, not in any exam classroom, but in the upper secondary exam classroom. So before I start, I would like to get uh, to you, and I would like you to type in the chat box where you're currently teaching, so what is your teaching context, whether you teach upper secondary exam classes or not, and if you do, could you please describe the experience in one word? So here are my answers. You can see them. Uh, I teach at the language school. I do teach at upper secondary exam classes, and I find the experience exciting. Good evening, Tamara. So let's see. It is a challenging environment. Hi, Eva. OK, rural area in the mountains, Alison. Really interesting. Challenging, enjoyable, great. Good evening, everyone. Hey, Portugal, good, nice. Rigorous programs, yes, we'll talk about that. Okay, challenging and rewarding. Okay. Great, so I'm just going to move forward a bit, but I will still be able to take a look at your comments. Rewarding, challenging, great. Okay, so let's take a look. Now, uh, I'm going to present the overview of the session, but I have to tell you that this is going to be a practical session. So the first three bullet points are going to be briefly talked about so that we can focus on the actual active part, which are the activities from the four skills. So I will start by talking about creativity in the upper secondary exam class. Then we will see the connection between creativity and the exam skills. And I will suggest um, four steps that we can take towards incorporating creativity in our lessons before we move on, as I said, to the actual practical activities on the four skills, which will be followed by extra suggestions. Now, since we're talking about creativity, I think the main question is, what is creativity? So it is a term that we've all thought about. It, I think that for most of us, it represents innovation, resourcefulness, and if we think about it, creativity is not only related to education, it relates to existence. So at the core of our human evolution lies creativity, because we have to survive. Now, of course, it is no wonder that uh, creativity has been so heavily researched in the field of ELT, from Osborne Pan's CPS model, to the bonus thinking hats, to brainstorming, mind mapping, uh, we are all familiar with different creative tools or um, approaches. Now, the question is, why is it relevant to exams? And for most of us, I think, or for most people, these two worlds are not seen as being related. Uh, and for me, this represents a paradox, because even throughout all the sessions today, we've talked so much about how important play is, how important drama is, hands-on activities for young learners. And I think that after a while, after certain levels or um, after our students have um, moved from the young learner class to the early teen class, uh, there seems to be a sudden shift in our mentality. So from the play-based pedagogy, we move on to the exam-oriented pedagogy. And I think this is very interesting because this is a shift that is not only represented in our mentality, in our, in our approaches, it's also represented in the materials that we use. So. For many people, it's difficult to see how we can combine two worlds that are often seen as being completely unrelated. Now, I think that one of the reasons why this happens has to do with the exam classroom itself. So I'm going to show you the bubbles, which I think are thoughts inside a teacher's head. And as you can see, there would be even more bubbles in the background. I think that especially when it comes to the upper secondary exam classroom, we're talking about an environment of high expectations an environment where the syllabus can be very demanding, uh, it emphasizes repetition, and there is a lot of stress and uncertainty, not only on the part of the learners, but also on the part of the teacher. Unfortunately, this can sometimes lead many of us to the idea of teaching to the test, 
which I suppose we all agree is counterproductive, not only in terms of exam performance, but also in terms of language learning. Uh, while this is happening, paradox number two strikes. And this paradox relates to the exam skills. So if you take a look at the exam skills that our learners are asked to show evidence of in the exams, skills such as critical thinking or analytical thinking, problem solving and collaborative skills, uh, what is surprising is that all these skills can be honed through creativity, can be further practiced through creativity. So as you see, we're talking about a situation where we leave creativity out of the picture, where we should instead bring creativity much deeper into the picture. So the problem then is that we teachers do not really know where to start from. So sometimes we feel that the opposite of being creative is sticking to a routine. And I think that what we miss out on is a gray zone in between the two extremes, which we can further exploit. So what I would like to suggest is that we follow a more step-by-step -step process. Now, the first thing that I feel we should do is acknowledge and embrace the exam reality. So whether we like it or not, at some point we will have to deal with multiple choice tasks. We will have to work on transformations. We will have to work on derivatives, word formation exercises. So if we embrace this reality, then we can reconsider our needs, prioritize what needs to change and what can be left as it is, and we can extend the existing tasks that we find in exams. We can combine different skills and then gradually move on to uh, creating new tasks. And for me, this is very important because sometimes we seem to emphasize how uh, significant transformation is. But if we think about it, how can we transform something that we don't know where it should start from? So I think that by starting uh, our journey through the acknowledgement of the exam classroom, then we have already made a very important step towards revolutionizing in the long run our teaching. So without any further ado, I would like to move on to the first task. And this is a reading task, and I would like your help on that. So as you can see on the top of, the, of my slide, I've written down a reverse and reconstruct, because one of the simplest changes that we can make is basically changing the order of um, information, changing the order of tasks. So instead of starting with the beginning of a reading task, we can start with the end. So I would just like you to take a look at the end of this uh, reading. It's taken from um, a, a B2 level uh, exam, one of the parts of the reading paper. And I would just like you to write down one task, it doesn't have to be a set of tasks, that you think could be generated using the ending as the beginning of the activity. So as I said before, this is the end of the text. Could you please type in the chat box one task that you think could be generated using the ending as the beginning? Mm -hmm. Right at the beginning, the team, okay, continue the story, reordering, great, Tamara. Get the students to predict what happened beforehand, Helen, yes. Produce an alternative ending, yes, why not? Reorder the story. That, these are great suggestions. Some of them are also on the next slide, so um, do we have any more ideas, perhaps? Okay, great suggestion, Daniela. I can see Mike. Okay, describe the characters. Great, these are all amazing ideas, guys. Let's see what Sonia has to say. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide, but I'm still taking a look at the chat box as well. Okay, so let me move on. Uh, that would be amazing, hey, Heidi. Thank you for the great idea. Okay, let me show you some of the possible ideas that I came up with. So, uh, as Helen has already said, predict what has already happened in the story, what will happen next. Write a new story through the, the perspective of Simone the Spy. This is what I meant before by extending the tasks and combining different skills. Uh, making students the examiners, ask them to create their own question or set of questions using this part of the text alone. And since, as uh, Eva said before, our students are digital natives, 
extend the task to their everyday lives. So we can uh, set up a quick Twitter challenge with the hashtag photo of the day. What photo and tweet would Sandy most likely share at the end of your day? But generally speaking, this process of reversing and reconstructing can also be taken into lots of different directions. So I would just like to show you uh, some other ideas that relate to that. So the, fir the, the first pictures are taken from a reading gallery task, which is a very simple task. I cut up the text into different pieces. I hang them, um, I, post, I post them, I tape them around the classroom, and then students walk around the classroom, they read the texts, and then I give them in groups uh, the answers or the questions in post-it notes, and they have basically to match the question uh, to the text or the answer to the text. I also like to hide clues uh, for uh, reading comprehension tasks in other sources, such as magazines, as you can see in the fourth picture. Uh, and I even involve my uh, students in the process of creating clues for their classmates or creating distractors. So, for example, in the picture with a girl who is blacking out a part of the text, she's preparing a gap text for her classmates and she's going to um, leave that part of the text out, but at the same time she's going to create a clue for her classmates as well. So, what else can we do in the reading part? I think that we can make a more active use of distractors. So, you know that um, in the answers there are going to be options that are going to confuse our learners. We can ask them to write questions, uh, the, the answer to which will be the actual distractors, or uh, give them the answers and ask them to guess the questions. Generally uh, speaking, involving the students in more inductive approaches. I really like the idea of asking my learners, giving them the question and asking them to write their own answers, or giving them the answers and asking them to uh, write their own questions. Uh, of course, the reading gallery, I'm going to the top of that, to the bottom story of that slide, can turn into a QR reading scavenger hunt where the texts are represented as QR codes, which you can print out and once again uh, tape around the classroom. And the third activity is one of my favorites. It involves uh, some drama techniques. One of the main challenges for my learners um, relate to uh, identifying the tone and purpose of the writer in a text. So what I do is uh, give them quotes from uh, famous works of literature, and then I ask them to act them out in different ways. That's the first part. And then what I ask them to do is I give them uh, adverbs, and I ask them to incorporate the adverbs in the quotes and try to imagine how their tone, um, the acting out, the, the um, utterance, the pronunciation of the quote would change accordingly. So I'm going to move on to the next skill, which is writing, and this is particularly challenging for our learners, especially for teenagers, for one main reason, and that, that's, I think, how our learners can support their arguments. Now, I know that you cannot see the essay topic very clearly, but it focuses on uh, university education and whether uh, university education should cover only language and literature or whether it should also uh, be devoted to uh, topics, subjects such as theater and music. So what I do is that I create profiles profiles of different people for my learners. This is an extension of, uh, I would say, the bonus thinking hats. Uh, and I give them, I split them in groups, and I give them the different profiles of the people. So, for example, you can see the profile of a teenager and the profile of um, a middle-aged woman who is a language teacher. And based on the profiles of the different people, they have to come up with arguments that these people would put forward in favor of or against the topic. So this helps them try and examine an issue from different perspectives, and it helps them get into the shoes of different people, which is often challenging for teenagers to do. Um, and we try to extend that to self-reflection exercises. So once this is over, I ask them, which, whose opinion would you adopt and why? How has this exercise helped you identify whose opinion you agree with uh, or not? So some other things that we can do when it comes to writing I'm going to leave out the last part because I think it's self-explanatory. We can take writing topics and turn them into debates. Um, I would like to focus a lot on the second and the third idea. Uh, I think that, and this is something that has been mentioned before today, I think it's very important to raise our students' awareness of social issues. So what I like doing is using artwork uh, by people uh, who, um, like John Fulford, I don't know if you're familiar with him, who focus a lot on um, social issues and how these are represented in society. And I give them the different pieces of art, and then I ask them in groups to sculpt in a way their emotions. So basically, I ask them to create a frozen tableau of how they feel about this issue using their bodies. 
And what we do afterwards is that they present their work to each other and then they have to explain to their classmates why they feel this way about this particular social issue. Uh, this can then turn into um, a full stage essay, that's what I mean by the third idea, um, where students once again in groups have to write the three parts of an essay on the same topic. Uh, one group has to write the introduction, the other the main body, and uh, another group has to write the conclusion, and students are asked to stand up and act out the different parts of the essay. And now I'm going to go to the last idea, which is the first one, how social media can be used for uh, writing. I love using, I think I've mentioned it before, I love using Instagram uh, stories as story starters. Uh, you know that especially in B2 level exams, students are asked to create stories using a specific story starter and two additional words. Uh, so I like, I ask them to use their own stories and the additional words are often the characters or the emojis that they incorporate in their stories. So they take their Instagram story and they then write what has happened next. I'm going to move on to the next skill, which is speaking. Uh, and this is once again a drama technique. Uh, it's a, I call it our class parameter, and I basically make use of the classroom, um, of, of the classroom space. I um, ask my students to imagine that the walls of the classroom represent um, the different um, sides to an issue. So, for example, the right wall is the agree side, the left wall is the disagree side. And I give them a list of statements and they basically have to go to the side uh, that they agree with. And of course, if your classroom is big, I'm fortunate enough to be working at a school where we have very big and spacious classrooms, you can even make use of the space in between. So once my students reach the side they agree with, they have to team up with their uh, classmates and they have to ask each other why, for example, Maria feels this way about schools and libraries. They write down each other's arguments and then at the end of the day, we have an alternative brainstorming activity in which all students have had their say and in which we have created, through which we have created a pool of useful ideas that they can use in their speaking as well as in their writing. Now, when it comes to speaking, the same activity can be extended if, for example, uh, you ask your students to raise the, their hand if they agree or disagree with an idea. I also like uh, using musical chairs and playing a game of musical chairs. I don't know if you have ever played musical chairs with your learners. I'm talking about young teenagers, not very young ones. Teenage learners. Great, Godana. I'm not the only person who thinks that musical chairs are for all ages. You should try it, Helen. They might giggle at the beginning, but then they will start getting into it. So what happens is that, of course, it's musical chairs with a twist. So at first they think that they're going to play, but they're not actually going to play. So what we do is that uh, once the music stops, instead of just removing a chair, I give my students um, a, something like a, a topic or um, a discussion card, which they have to uh, either discuss with their classmates or a personal question that they would find in the speaking exam and they would have to answer for themselves. Now, the second activity, which I call before and after, is actually cutting pictures in halves and asking my students to guess what the first, part, the first half of the picture uh, shows and then what the other half could be. And this is great, especially for B2 level exams where students struggle with uh, language on speculation, making assumptions. Um, and then, of course, this could be extended to before and after pictures and um, be taken into a writing task as well. Um, once again, focusing on this type of uh, speculative task, I give them, I'm sure you're familiar with, that part of the speaking test where they have to discuss different ideas and then they have to reach a consensus, they have to reach an agreement on which, for example, um, extracurricular activity would be great for their school. So what I do is that I give them all the different ideas, all the different suggestions, but I leave out the central question. So instead of um, asking them to discuss the ideas first, we discuss what the central question could be, why these ideas are helpful, these suggestions are helpful, and uh, then we see whether they've guessed the central question right or not. And the last one has to do with fillers, and it's an actual buying time activity, of course, with fake money. I split my students in groups once again, and I tell them that uh, they have to do a certain speaking task, 
task, sorry, but in order for them to do it, they have to buy fillers. So using their fake money, they have to buy as many fillers as they need. And I think that this is extremely important because fillers and fatty communication in general is um, an aspect that our learners often struggle with. And uh, this is, uh, at least in my case, their major cause of stress and anxiety in the exams. So it helps them see how they can incorporate feelers into um, the actual uh, task as well. So I'm going to go to the last skill, which is listening. And for this one, I hope that the link will work. I would like you to click on the picture. It's going to take you to a task which I've created on learning apps. Just tell me whether the link works. Okay, great. So if it works, you don't have to do the whole task. You can even do it after the, uh, my session. Uh, if it works, you will see that you have very simple descriptions of people uh, who you have to match to their pictures. They are taken from, um, a, I, I created it a while ago, and they're taken from a, a vocabulary task that students had to do. And it was a pre-listening task that students had to do before they actually moved on to the uh, listening task itself. Um, now, the thing is that, of course, this is just a very simple example of what you can do with learning apps and, generally speaking, other web tools. You can even take the actual listening task, break the different um, dialogues or conversations into chunks, just like the audios which you've just seen, and ask the learners to match them, either with a script or with pictures of people. I'm not a huge fan of using photos all the time because, as we've said before, um, the photos tend to be a little bit stereotypical at times. So if you can find the scripts and if you can do it this way, that would be even better. Now, listening, of course, is a skill that most learners seem, at least my, most of my learners seem to be more familiar with because of their everyday reality, because of the fact that they're exposed to different speakers every day through social media. But still, I think that one of the area which they seem to struggle with is anticipatory, anticipatory sorry, listening, so speculative listening. They, they don't, it's not easy for them to assume, to uh, speculate what is going to happen next in a conversation, what kind of information they will be asked to look for. Uh, so what I like to do is, um, especially with uh, fill in the gaps tasks, I give them the gap uh, sentences. They don't know what the talk will be about, and then I ask them to fill them in using their own words which is um, a simple idea which you can try and use every time that you see that you still struggle with this part of the test. Um, another idea which I love using is um, matching, splitting my learners once again into groups and asking them, giving half of them the scripts, the other half the answers, and ask them to find their pair. Um, the third uh, task is closer to, I would also say, to a presentation task. So I give them a pool of different topics that they can choose from. Uh, all of the topics have to do with science, and these prepare them for the longer, often part three or part four section of the listening tests, which they are asked to take at the C B2 to C2 level. And they are asked to prepare their own scientific speech, which they can either present in, ta in class, or they can record and create a task on it for their students for their, sorry, classmates, for the other students. And last, one of my favorite activities, which is taken from movie clips. I don't know whether you're familiar with movie clips. They, all, they also have um, uh, a YouTube channel, is what comes next. I first came across what comes next, um, because uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, some years ago. So there is a section on movie clips called what comes next, in which the actual video poses and then uh, you are presented with a list of options on what the speaker might have said. So uh, if you don't want to, I don't know whether these clips are available anymore, but if you don't want to do something like that, you can simply present your students with uh, clips, either from TV series or movies, pose them at uh, certain points and ask them to predict what they will listen to next. Um, Manal, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, I said that uh, the buying time activity has to do with the idea that learners are presented with feelers. I split them into groups, and they have, using fake money, 
to uh, buy as many fillers as they feel they would need for the activity. For example, expressions such as, um, let me think about it. It's, it's on the tip of my tongue. Um, what do you think? I haven't thought about this in the past. They buy as many fillers as they need, and then they start doing the speaking task in class uh, together with their classmates or with me if it is a teacher-student uh, task. So I'm going to stop now for your questions. Thanks a lot. I also had some extra activities which we might look at in case there aren't any questions, but thank you so much for being with me and I look forward to your questions. Manal, I hope that's clear now. Thank you, everyone. Okay, are there any questions, for Maria, just before we wrap up? We still have a few minutes. You're getting a lot of thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because I can see that and I really appreciate it. Um, mm. Mohammed, you're asking how can we apply these topics in classes, which could are ah, with lots of students. Um, I would say that what you can do is group them uh, I would, in in case of uh, large classes, I would only go for uh, activities which uh, involve groups. So if you group them in, if it's doable, in groups of seven or eight, uh, and then you give them a task such as the, um, guessing the central question or buying the fillers task, I think it's going to work this way. Of course, when we talk about large classes, not all of these activities can be uh, used right away. But if you try to adjust them to your setting, I think they can work. Um, they depend, of course, my learners are, my classes are up to nine or ten people, so I'm much more flexible than you are. But I hope that some of them at least can be used with, um, with groups as well of seven to eight students. Uh, obviously, Sonia. I actually, I like doing that. So most of the times, I don't ask them to defend the, the point that they agree with, I ask them to defend the the opposite point yeah, i think it's really important especially for teenagers to become more active um interpreters of information and knowledge i said it before I, I don't remember whose session i made that comment in um they are consumers of information they're mm -hmm. consumers of uh knowledge and i want them to become producers <laughs> so definitely yes okay any final questions yeah you've got 32 in your class oh my god <laughs> But still, guys, no, 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 I'm just said. asking if there's any final Sorry. questions before we wrap home. up. Can I just make one point before we have any, I don't know, further questions? Um, I think that the important, the important thing to uh, take away is not so much the ideas and the suggestions which I've made. The important mm -hmm. thing for me is for each one of us to look at our classroom setting. That's why I said that we should embrace our classroom setting and then see how we can prioritize. Not all of these things can be done in all the contexts of the world. So try to adjust your teaching to the needs of your learners and to your teaching context. Uh, and I've seen this a lot as a trainer as well. Many people want to revolutionize their teaching. It can't be done. You can't change your teaching and be, it can be done, but as long as you're true to yourself and to your teaching context and your learners. So adjust the activities to your personality, your context, your needs. Okay, that's great. I think, I think that's all the questions that we have. So, um, so I guess we you're can welcome. close. Um, Maria, I just want to say thank you for your session. I think it's really clear that you've got this real depth of experience as an educator and you really like you really know what you're talking about and I think that in this very short session you gave us all a lot of ideas of I think it's just a lot of engaging teaching with with upper secondary but also it's related to exams but actually it's just kind of 
really good practice. So, like, thank you so much for that. Um, thank you. And uh, let's have a 10 minute break before we come back for the next talk. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the other sessions. Hi Amanda, yeah I can hear you and I can see you, which is a good start. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs>